Speaker English. Herr Präsident, Mr. President, Excellencies, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, liebe Gäste, esteemed Im guests, Namen der Kerber in the name of the Kerber Foundation, I would willkommen. like to es welcome you all. Ehre it is a Freude, great honor and a great pleasure to Präsidenten welcome Dr. the Tunisian Monse President Dr. Monsef 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 today and his delegation. Mr. President, Gäste, esteemed guests, herzlich willkommen in Deutschland, welcome to Germany, welcome to Berlin, and welcome at the Kerber Foundation. Meine Damen und Herren, Ladies Tunesien and gentlemen, hat Tunisia has Die made history. The act of desperation by a young green grocer in a provincial town mid-December 2010 had within a very short period of time an unforeseen knock-on effect. It was the catalyst of the so-called Tunisian Yasmin revolution that resonated across a number of other countries and has radically changed the Arab world. Since the beginning of the Arab revolution, we have been witnessing upheavals of historic proportions whose impacts, also the impacts on Europe, we're only starting to gauge. The region is undergoing a profound transformation, which um, despite all the setbacks and detours would hopefully lead to the emergence of societies in which political, economic and social participation for all citizens would not be just a wish, but a reality. The transformation of societies and political systems is a lengthy, tedious and occasionally frustrating process. This is also manifested by the recent events in Tunisia. The assassination of the opposition politician Shokri Belaid at the beginning of February has pushed the cradle of the Arab revolution again into a crisis. How are we to narrow the ever-increasing gap between secular and religious uh, forces? How are we to improve the economic and social living conditions of the Tunisian people? How are we to put the road towards democracy on a solid institutional ground? Despite all the challenges, we firmly believe that Tunisia has opted for a democratic and a pluralistic future, and it would continue to tread this path. The human rights activists and the opponent of the Ben Ali regime, the first democratically elected president of Tunisia, Dr. Marzouki, is struggling for solutions to these numerous challenges that his country is facing, and he's trying to build bridges across political, ideological, and social barriers. We, um, it is a tremendous pleasure to welcome him here today. Ladies and gentlemen, just two months ago, we welcomed Dr. Mohamed Morsi, the president of another important country in transformation in the Arab world. This uh, coincidence shows that uh, the Kerber Foundation is really interested in facilitating an exchange of views with the new actors who have come into the political limelight as a result of the Arab Revolution. On the decision-making level, the civil society, in the civil society and in the public sphere. We would like to contribute to a comprehensive understanding of the different actors and their aims, regardless of their political and ideological affiliations. The fact that such a large number of high-ranking representatives of politics, government, economy, academia, and the civil society have taken up our invitation shows that there is a great interest in this dialogue. I would like to welcome especially 
the representatives of the younger generation who are among us today, the members of the Kerber Network Foreign Politics, the students of the Free University in Berlin, and the members of the project Yuma, Young Muslim Active. My colleague, Dr. Thomas Paulson, Executive Director, International Affairs, will moderate the discussion today with President Marzuki because you, ladies and gentlemen, should also get the opportunity to ask uh, your question. It is a tradition here at the, the Kerber Foundation. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to His Excellency Ghariani and uh, His Excellency Ambassador Ghaliani and his team at the Tunisian Embassy for the excellent cooperation in organizing this event. Mr. President, once again, we would like to welcome you, and I kindly ask you to take the floor. Mr. Vreed, Chairman of the Kerber Foundation, Mr. Wehmeyer, Vice Chairman of the Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, allow me to speak to you without using the papers as reference on a very friendly basis, on an informal basis. I think that words that come from the heart to the heart and from the mind to the mind are more important than any formal rhetorics, any formal address. You know, you all know that the events in Tunisia changed the scape, the landscape of the whole Arab world. They pushed, they changed in all other countries, and this change won't be reversed, it won't stop. Starting from Tunisia, a path was created, and this path will be treaded to its end, meaning that the, the old Arab political system died in the minds and the hearts, and now we are about to bury it. I'm speaking about all places and all regions. There will not be an Arab country that will not be reached by the consequences of the Arab Spring. The choice is now in front of all Arab regimes, change or perish. That was my first point. My second point is we did not do the first revolution in history. There are rules applied to every revolution. Every revolution has its price. Every revolution has its counter-revolution. Or, for example, that the revolutionaries are not necessarily those who profit from it. Or that revolutions could fail, meaning the Arab revolution, the Tunisian revolution could fail or succeed. And no one can estimate the results or the end result. What are the measures for success or failure? The parameters for success, at least, are naturally for a human rights activist, are the foundation of democratic systems respecting human rights and enshrining the rights of the society that they stemmed from. The parameters for failure is that the process of change is too pricey, and this is what we are experiencing in Syria right now. Re it's in my worst nightmares, I would not have imagined that the Syrian people, one of the most respected, um, civilized and people of the Arab world, could pay such a high price for their freedom. I think we can say that the Syrian revolution has failed. Even before looking at the um, future events, Right now, we have chaos, and this is the greatest danger, because af after chaos comes despotism. People endure despotism, but they do not endure chaos. 
This is a senseless revolution in that case. In that case, it would be a revolution that resulted in chaos that returned us in return to despotism. In my opinion, failure, and this is when we are in front of crossroads, at a crossroads, in all countries of the Arab Spring, we are at a crossroads. Either we can realize a, a, a crucial change to a modern civil state that is future-oriented, or we take a step back and we have a setback uh, through the emergence of uh, uh, Islamistic emirates, uh, jihadist emirates, and we are at these crossroads now. And no one can estimate the future progress or the future Events. I will not speculate on uh, the future events in uh, considering the Tunisian revolution. I know that the revolution continues, the old political system is over, there will be crucial change in the structure of this region. Some countries will, um, will perish, some other countries will be unified. I think the map in the coming 10 or 20 years will be completely different. And I I believe that all peoples will pay different prices, varying prices for their revolutions, and I am sure that it will take many years until we see results. And some people cannot show enough patience and want to see um, results now. I, I suggest that they read some historical books uh, so that they know that political changes need years, and I think Tunisia has done a lot of progress in that context. I can say that the chances of success for the Tunisian revolution are much higher than the fa failure chances or the chances for failure. I uh, am not inspiring myself or um, doing any propaganda. Um, I weigh my words very well. I am saying this because there is a number of special characteristics for the Tunisian revolution and the Tunisian country that lead me to say or to think that this experience will be fruitful and that this crossroads we are now at will lead to ultimately to a civil state and to economic prosperity. Why am I saying this? In the past 14 months, we underwent four crises, four dangerous crises. The first in April 2012, uh, when the opposition demanded the end of the regime in Tunisia. May 1st was a great day when all people went to the streets and called on the national unity and all attempts to create chaos failed. On September 14th, Sal um, Salafists attacked the American embassy and almost caused a catastrophe. Even then, uh, the people stood by each other, showed solidarity, and uh, the wishes of Salafists or the dreams of Salafists did not come true. The third crisis, and I will talk about, uh, I will come to talk about this opposition, they talked about the end of the legitimacy on October 23rd, but um, the fourth crisis was the a hideous crime, the murder of Shukri Balaid, our martyr. This murder targeted at creating chaos. Four huge crises that did not manage to create chaos in Tunisia. Why? For a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, we have a civil army, an army that protected the legitimacy of the country, a completely different um, from the Syrian army. The Syrian army protects the gangs uh, from the people, but the Tunisian army is completely different. The Egyptian and the Syrian armies protect gangs. They are ready to kill their own people in, or, in order to protect these gangs. But the Tunisian army protected the people. This is a very important characteristic of the Tunisian experience. 
There is also an important political experience, which is the consensus, the experience of consensus. It's not out of tactics. It was not born out of the spur of the moment, but it's, it's the um, child of our, it's the fruit of our experience through of despotism. Uh, we as Democrats, uh, leftists and Islamists, we all came to the conclusion that our fate is common. We had to cooperate. And when the revolution emerged, when the revolution was launched, we had learned the language of dialogue. The Troika, the existing Troika, is a one of a kind experience. And I think that this this will be the salvation of Tunisia. This will be the reason why we won't have a chaos erupting in Tunisia. Arab societies suffer from a huge gap between a conservative part, a component of the society, and a modern component that is Western-oriented. And a huge part of these social classes identify more with the West than with the place they live in. This gap doesn't exist here in Europe. I don't think that this cultural gap that exists in our society between the conservative Arab Islamic component of society and another component of society that, that belongs to the West or feels a huge belonging to the West. And also, there is a huge gap between those who uh, are well off and those who are less well off or very poor. And this contradiction, the previous regimes used to solve this through violence. A part, one component uh, seizes power and then uses violence against the other components. This is why we experienced several catastrophes. We want to abridge these gaps. We built the Troika based on a very simple idea. This society has to have a government reflecting the nature of the society. And if we want this government to include representatives of the Islamic trends and the civil trends, this experience will only succeed when both are moderate. It cannot include fundamentalists, secular fundamentalists and Islamist fundamentalists. The Troika is composed of moderate Islamists and moderate secularists. And the others remained on the margin, the fundamentalist seculars who fight the Troika with all they have, all possibilities, because they completely rejected the presence of Islamists in it, and the other fundamentalist side that uses terrorism because they don't accept the existence of secularists. This is the special characteristic of the Tunisian experience, and I think we enjoy a great consensus among the Tunisian people who identify with the Troika. The challenge is to realize this, pluralisti this pluralism in society. We have two countries in one, as I always say. We have the poor Tunisia, the rural Tunisia, the Tunisia of poor regions, also poor suburbs of the cities. Tunisia has a great challenge, which is the living conditions. We have other, the westernized, the modern, the secular Tunisia, whatever, how, however we call it. So it's not about the name of the, um, of the phenomena, it's about the living conditions. And if you want to reach the consensus, and, um, it, then we have a great challenge to listen to the poor Tunisia and to listen to the modern Tunisia and tell them, assure them that the rights of women will not be touched, will not be broken. And this composition is our target, is our objective, and I think that it's a very successful composition, as all discussions that 
are ongoing, especially considering the Constitution, give us very positive signs that we are on the right path. The first winning card for Tunisia in order to overcome, easily overcome the transitional phase is, first of all, an army that protected the people, protected the legitimacy, um, that re rejected all calls uh, on entering the political stage, we have a political elite that was able to compose this composition or create this composition, uh, this one-of-a-kind composition. We have a political uh, econ economic pot uh, potential. We have a very positive index at the moment. Growth index. And in addition to that, we are enjoying and experiencing a lot of support, especially from our friends in Germany. I think that Tunisia is the winning card for this democratic transition. This does not mean at all that we don't have problems. We are affected uh, and endangered by the war in Mali. We are. Um, threatened by the um, by Libya and we are trying to reach uh, security and political solutions the war in Syria has moved to Tunisia we have youth going to Syria and fighting there and we are afraid that they will return just as traumatized as the youth the Algerian youth returned from Afghanistan there are realistic threats and we are we aren't sparing effort to win more time. We work day and night to finish drafting the constitution. We are working day and night to organize the elections that will hopefully take place between October and December. In Tunisia, we have a clear roadmap at the moment, finished drafting the constitution. It's a consensus constitution, and this constitution will be ready before the end of the spring. Afterwards, the organization of the elections that will take place before the end of the year. And if we succeed in all these steps whilst looking for all possibilities of consensus, um, next week I have uh, invited all political parties to agree on the last points of dispute in the Tunisian constitution problems considering the um, powers between the president and the other state institutions. If we succeed in uh, solving these issues, and we will, and the, cons the constitution will be a constitution of consensus that allows every Tunisian to identify with it, and then the elections, and then have after having a stable country in five years. I, I won't say that we will completely end poverty, but I am sure that we will alleviate uh, to a great degree poverty. And then we would be able to say that the price of the revolution was very cheap, because I think until now we have been uh, the, the revolution that paid the least price of all. The transition phase was not as long as you can imagine. We were able to um, achieve a great progress and create, for the first time in the history of Tunisia, create a government that reflects the diversity of the society, which would be a government for all Tunisians and not only a government representing half of the Tunisian people. We also would like to be part of the peace. As I was saying before, Europe has not uh, witnessed peace um, until after the collapse of dictatorships. You in Germany have not been able to form the, Euro the European Union until fascism was, was uh, eliminated. The, the collapse of dictatorships and um, the um, combating of uh, chaos and uh, avoiding the uh, jihadist Islamist course, that means that there is a possibility of the emergence of an Arab Union which would follow the example of the European Union because uh, the obstacles of this union were, in fact, uh, these dictatorships, just as it was the case in Europe. This Arab Union or these democratic countries 
are the guarantor for your peace and your uh, security because God forbid if these experiences fail we would have either chaos or um, jihadist and Islamist emirates and this would truly lead to what we call the clash of civilization we think that the future would be uh, would take a different course it would be um, a, a getting closer between uh, civilizations and that would be due to the Arab revolution it's a social revolution it's a so revolution that strives to um, achieve democracy and it was a revolution that can be relied on and I'm very happy to say that Germany is playing a crucial role in supporting the revolution in Tunisia politically at this level of, of security and also culturally uh, my conviction was solidified through my talks with high-ranking politicians throughout the last two years and I think Germany when it invests in the Tunisian democratic experience and invests in the democratic experience in all Arab countries that means that it invests in international peace, in achieving peace between civilizations, and I think this is of paramount importance. I would like to conclude my speech here. Um, I, I'm, I would like to apologize to those who have written my speech because I do prefer uh, to look people in the eye and talk freely and express what uh, I feel. So, I hope I have uh, asked, uh, I, I have um, answered some questions, and thank you for your attention. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. President, I hope you can understand me. You have said once before You said uh, before that Islam is not the solution. And uh, throughout the past two years, uh, since the beginning of the revolution, we have been witnessing political victory by the Islamist forces and the Islamist powers. You uh, or your party is uh, a liberal socialist party, so against this background, against the victory and the increasing influence of Islamist forces, how do you see the future of uh, liberal, uh, the liberal wing in the Arab uh, world? Do you think this uh, liberal wing has a future? Uh, first, allow me to um, concentrate on uh, Tunisia. I don't want to generalize my comments. When the elections were held, the number of representatives representative in the uh, Constituent Assembly was uh, 270. 98 of them belong to the Anahda. 89 of them belong to the Anahda uh, party. It's not the majority, as you see. So the Anahda party is um, the biggest uh, political party, but it's not the dominating one. And uh, the uh, proof is that it was not able to govern without getting into to a coalition with other parties. The, secular spa for the, uh, the, the same holds true for secular parties. We did need this coalition. So the coalition um, has um, imposed itself on us. When, we were when I was talking uh, about uh, this um, society, which is composed of two parts, this is exactly what's reflected uh, in the elections. We can't say, we can't uh, engage with uh, this force or that force. This is part of 
with uh, uh, people, and we have to understand that uh, the Islamist constitutes a movement. It's very important to understand uh, that there is not only one form of Islam. When I said Islam is not the solution, what I meant is the politicized Islam is not the solution. So it's important to understand that there is a large spectrum of Islamist movements, and we can't make uh, mistakes. I always give the example of uh, communist um, parties. There are communists. There were communist communist um, movements in Cambodia and other communist um, movements in Italy. We can't say that both are the same. We can't say Ranuja and Taliban represent the same thing. This is simply wrong. There are Islamist parties which um, can be described as democratic Islamist party. And you, in Germany, you can understand that better than others. You have uh, Christian parties or Christian-oriented parties. Now, in the Arab countries, we are witnessing the emergence of um, democratic Islamist parties. We also, we're also witnessing the emergence of violent Islamist movements, politicized Islamist movements. This is a large spectrum. In Tunisia, we are engaging with the democratic, non-violent Islamist party, and we do not have any other choice. These uh, peoples. Um, are um, a, a rich texture of different components. So we need to accept the reality. Otherwise, we, we, we can reject each other, and this would lead to a civil war. This is exactly what we would like to avoid. This, And I, 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 I thank God that uh, the political forces have been as wise so that we were able to avoid this kind of uh, conflict. Now, we have established a functioning democracy, and it is uh, connected with a culture of democracy, that there is some kind of consensus of um, on um, the, rule of the rules of the game, and it seems that for those who are following the news in your country, it seems that there is the so-called policy of the street, policy of the people. It is increasingly being influential. Uh, that those who can mobilize more people can achieve their political targets. How can we talk about policies inside the institutions? How can we claim that the policy making happens in the institutions and not on the street? And considering the cultural democracy or demo democratic culture. I hope I didn't misunderstand your question, uh, but the idea that uh, democracies only emerge in societies that have this democratic culture, I think the Arab revolutions proved this theory wrong. Uh, peoples who have never, who had never learned democracy were able to achieve it. At 2007, I was in the um, opposition and I went to observe the elections in Mauritania. I experienced the best elections you could imagine, organization-wise, transparent, considering transparency. Mauritanians are very poor, are, um, in quotation marks, uh, undereducated people, underdeveloped people, and they have no de uh, cult de democratic culture, and still they succeeded in their elections. In the past 20 years, we learned all democratic tricks, and that's how uh, it was, it was, we were able to achieve this democracy. I think the undemocratic experience is in itself a democratic experience because it teaches the people how they should act. We were not born yesterday. We have been there for 2,800 years. We have historical, um, ex historical experiences. This is our eighth constitution in Tunisia. The first constitution was the Cartago um, constitution. We had uh, a council of the wise and different councils throughout histories. We have a very long history. And 
I don't want people to imagine that we learned democracy just yesterday. I was the um, in the uh, high, uh, and Tunisian League for Human Rights, the chairman of the Tunisian League. We had media, we had press, we had a human rights movements, a very strong movement, and these experiences accumulate with time. So we have a maybe reverse democratic experience that we learned through the despotic experience. Now to the demonstrations. Democracy is the right to, ex to express yourself and the right to, to protest. Tunisians finally have the right to protest. How are we supposed to tell them not to protest? Because this will give a bad impression to the West. On the contrary, protests have become a natural, a normal thing. I lived in Paris. I have seen protests that end up with breaking glass and breaking vitrines. We are a completely democratic people. The street speaks, the press say, uh, express their opinion, sometimes they exaggerate, but it's all part of the democratic experience. We cannot be blamed for activating democracy, including all the negative points about it. The democratic system, we are experiencing it. Of course, we want to enhance it. Um, in all humility, or maybe I'm not being uh, humble, but we are not ready to copy-paste another experience, a foreign experience, and implement it 100% as it is, and, um, or copy an experience with the role of the press, with the role of the media, as it is in the original experience. We want to enhance, we will maybe enhance even the Western democracies, and maybe it will be the irony of fate that those undereducated, underdeveloped people will reach a level of democracy that is even beyond the Western democracies. It is an experience, and we are part of this experience now and I am sure that we will add a lot to it. Is there a large number, rather there are, in, uh, there is in Tuni Tunisia a large number of associations for the protection of uh, revolution. Do you think uh, that um, the role of these groups is a bit controversial because they resort to violence? Uh, do you think they do protect uh, the revolution, as the name says, uh, in the formal speech at the occasion of uh, the anniversary of independence? I said very clearly. Uh, in Tunisia, there were no organizations which claimed to protect the revolution because the revolution is already protected by its legitimate institutions, by the army, by civil institutions, by its clever and mature people. This is, a, this is why I would say very clearly there is no place, there is no need for these associations. Either they become civil groups 1,000% or they need to be dissolved. What do you need? What do you mean um, exactly when you say there is no need for these associations, for these groups? There is no place for them. What I said is that these uh, groups, if they are civil groups, cultural groups, to call for the revolution to support the revolution, that's fine. But if they constitute hidden militias, that's unacceptable. Any democratic country cannot allow violence, cannot allow holding any weapons uh, except by members of the army and members of the armed forces generally. Uh, Mr. President, uh, please allow me to ask a question concerning your foreign policy. And I would like then to open the floor for the audience to ask questions. You uh, talked about the conflict in Mali and the terrorist threats that could affect Tunisia. You also said that it um, uh, threatens the stability of uh, Northern Africa and uh, the Middle East. You also said um, weapons are supplied to extremist groups. Do you think it's better, or have you? Uh, would you have preferred a diplomatic solution rather than a, po a, a political solution, a military solution rather? 
Don't you think we need the military aspects? Uh, and what are the political means that could be used to achieve stability in Mali today? The uh, official position of Tunisia concerning the Mali events was as follows. We, ha we were understanding the uh, French um, intervention. We understood uh, the necessity of this intervention, and I said that, uh, unfortunately, this intervention was necessary. However, what we focus on is that security solutions with this, uh, to this uh, Salafist phenomenon, the security solutions would fail on the long run. Maybe they would be crowned with success at the sh on the short term, but in the long term, they would fail. So I, uh, I'm afraid that after this French intervention, and today the French army uh, maybe will uh, withdraw, withdraw quite soon, uh, we would face uh, the problems which prompted this crisis in the first place. The roots of this problem is um, the problem of uh, the Arabic minority, which lives in Mali, whose rights are not acknowledged, and of course the issue of poverty. Um, so, um, if we uh, if you want to combat this bee's nest and the, the roots of the problems, we need to uh, promote uh, stability in Mali. We need to have a project to develop these poor areas, and we need a very strong government in Bamako that would uh, take the responsibility for establishing uh, peace. What I'm afraid of is when terrorism issues are addressed and Salafist issues are addressed, uh, we, we immediately think about the uh, military solution. As a doctor, as a physician, I know that if you give aspirin to your patient, it's just uh, to uh, lower your fever, but it doesn't address the roots of the problem. It, you're just covering the problem, but you, we, you're not so resolving the issue. We don't want to cover the problems. We, we want to resolve the roots of the problem. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And now I would like to give you to open the floor and to give you the opportunity to ask Mr. President uh, all the questions you would like to ask. Uh, there are two microphones um, to um, Ladies are going around the room and give you the microphone. Please stand up if you do ask a question. And I would uh, uh, kindly ask you to keep it short. Uh, Mrs. Kama. My name is uh, Viola von Kram. I'm a member of the German parliament. I was also a member of the observer mission of the um, Tunisian election, I would like to express my appreciation and I would like to praise uh, the way of uh, the way how the uh, elections have been held. I compare them to the elections held in um, the pre uh, uh, Soviet countries, ex Soviet countries. It was um, uh, one of a kind elections. We observed that the election started at 7 a.m. They stood in long queues in front of the polling stations and uh, were patient enough to be able to give their um, vote. We uh, saw that people were so happy, so delighted that they finally got the opportunity to give their vote after having, wait, having waited for 40 years. They've been um, struggling to achieve democracy, to achieve freedom, and I would like like to praise you and um, uh, show our appreciation of the way you organized the elections. It was simply excellent. Uh, this was our impression. It was a positive impression. And I wanted to um, express this thought. Thank you very much.
My name is Reinhard uh, Spinner. I'm, I'm also a member of the Parliament. According to our interpretation, the turmoil and uh, the upheavals have been crowned with success because a whole generation of citizens have acknowledged that they do not have any prospects for a better life. This is what prompted the revolution in the first place. Now, after two years, my questions to you as president of this country is, do you see that the problems uh, that uh, mobilize people and uh, push them to, go, to take to the streets, do you think these problems have been addressed? What are the main problems uh, that this country uh, is facing? Do you think uh, they're tackled uh, appropriately? And what? Um, and do you think those people who took to the streets have faith that the future would be a better, f a better one? What chances are there for success? People took to the streets to demonstrate uh, against poverty and unemployment. They also protested against suppression and oppression to keep their mouths shut. However, there is a major factor which played a crucial role in uh, the Tunisian revolution, which is corruption. Corruption was widespread. It was regarded, the scandalous uh, corruption was um, regarded as a personal insult. People were not even ashamed of showing it and practicing it. So this led to a bleeding. Again, I'm talking from the perspective of a physician. So there is a constant uh, bleeding uh, caused by corruption. You cannot imagine this sort of bleeding. Again, uh, we think that the amount of assets that were stolen by Ben Ali and his family amounts to $34 billion. Corruption is not the only, um, is, is is not only um, practiced by Bin Ali a family, there is also corruption in the field of customs and in the field of tax evasions, or, or is taking the form of tax evasions, um, about public tenders and public bids. The problem of this dictatorship was that it was uh, comparable to a, a mafia, to a mafia. People just exploded, not because of the poverty, but also because of this scandalous cap uh, corruption that you were, th you were not they're not able to bear anymore. This was a very important factor. Today, I'll just give you an example. Unfortunately, uh, when Boazizi self uh, emulated his, uh, himself, uh, some young people <laughs> just followed suit, but it doesn't um, have the same effect uh, the, the, the fa because the factors which led to the revolution in third place are not there anymore. So corruption, uh, poverty, and oppression. These were the reasons for uh, corruption. Today, we have no oppression anymore. Uh, people are free. Uh, secondly, uh, there is no corruption anymore. You, people know that uh, we have overcome corruption to a large extent. Of course, some institutions are still corrupt, but it's still controlled to a certain extent. They know that there is an, the intention to combat um, corruption. The last factor is unfortunately still there, poverty. It is a very uh, dangerous element and, uh, and could uh, be, of, uh, be of detriment to our um, stability. We don't uh, have a um, magical, a magic stick that could turn our uh, situation um, so quickly. And people understand that. People do have uh, this understanding. And they say, we don't demand a quick change of conditions. We just um, ask you to work hard to um, take uh, 
the corrupt actors uh, accountable or hold them accountable for their actions. And uh, the thing that people don't like about what we do is that we are too slow in holding those people accountable. But I would, um, I think people would be patient if they're conf confident that there is a true um, intention to combat uh, corruption. So we are combating poverty, but this is a long-term project. But when this bleeding stops, and when our assets are not stolen, when we can uh, enhance the performance of the um, customs institution, etc., then I say we, we we won't. I wouldn't say we won't need any uh, foreign help or foreign support anymore. But I would just say we would need less support. Mr. President, Mr. President, please allow me to ask you two questions that we received through Twitter. And I would also um, like to ask all the young um, people in the public to address us with their questions, if they have any. The first question over Twitter, Mr. President, do you actually trust Mr. Ganushi? And the second question is, are you still as secular as you were nine years ago? When you ask me the question about trust, do you think, had I not as much trust in him, the question is provocative to a certain extent. Yes, I trust Mr. Ganusi for a very simple reason. We are, we are in contact for 30 years. It goes 30 years back. It's impossible that we would stay in contact for 30 years if there was no trust. And I think we played a, a huge role in the current strategy of national consensus. We oh, suffered together from oppression and suppression. I got to know him in the 80s through the Tunisian League for Human Rights. Afterwards, when I was the chairman of the League and I defended Islamists while uh, as a secularist, and I will come to this question later, of course, I am still secularist. I defended them back then. Remember when they uh, took the communists, I pretended to be deaf when they took the Jews, I pretended uh, not to experience that. And when they took my neighbors, I pretended not to experience it. And when they took me, I realized I should have shown solidarity with others. And I to I've always told others, after the Islamists, they will come after you, every single one. Sheikh Rashid and me met in exile. Uh, he was in London, I was in Paris. We had many dialogues and discussions to the early hours of the morning. He's a thinker. And I write and think, too. We had very prolonged discussions about democracy, about approach, about the convergence of perspectives. This was the beginning of our convergence, and I tried to gather all political actors in Aix-en-Provence in 2003. Back then, we reached a consensus about the collective picture that we want to send out about Tunisia. We could reach an approach in perspectives. We acknowledge the Muslim identity, Muslim-Arab identity of the country, and you also acknowledge on your turn the right of the country for a modern, future-oriented perspective. And this this consensus, 2003, was the, is the foundation of our strategy today. We are in a continuous discussion. Sheikh Rad al I met, I meet him uh, twice a week. We are in a continuous dialogue, continuous discussion of such a depth that gives Tunisia this one-of-a-kind experience. I would like to alert you, the word secular in the Arab language causes a problem, is a cause of a problem. 
problem. Um, I talked once to a Muslim group about democracy, and I told them, as Islamists, I will talk to you as a secularist. And the chairman of this discussion took the microphone and said, Dr. Marzuki doesn't mean that he's an atheist. And only at that moment, I understood that to a great part of Islamists, secular and atheist is the same. I'm not an atheist. I believe. I'm a believer. But what does a secularist mean? Secularist means that you don't want the state to intervene in religious affairs, and you don't want religion to intervene in state affairs, because religion are the people, are the believers, and those believers can misuse the religion for their own targets. The state isn't a meta-human um, body. It consists of the human beings. We want a civil state consider that considers all these sensitive issues, protects the woman who wants to wear niqab, protects the woman who wants to wear hijab, uh, protects the woman who doesn't want to wear either, a, a state that protects all believers of all different convictions and doesn't allow any side to um, exert any oppression against another one. It is completely independent from any issues of belief or personal convictions. Of course, I'm still a secularist, and I will not spare any effort to prevent any hegemony um, exerted by, exercised by one part of the society over the other. I see only dictatorship behind these um, fundamentalist uh, movements, and I think that a dictatorship um, wearing a religious mask or a nationalist mask or any mask, it's the same skeleton. It only has a different skin, one's red, one's black, it's the same skeleton and it is not acceptable under any circumstances. We cannot allow religion to intervene in personal issues, personal affairs of and political affairs of people, issues of personal conviction and personal, personal beliefs. It's part of this culture. But when we have different political opinions, I will not allow you to tell me, but God said, but the prophet said, and that these are and self-evident uh, points of views. You are human, I am human, we have different political points of view, but these arguments that are supposed to be absolute arguments will not be accepted. It's about interest, it's about conflict, political conflict, and neither God nor the Prophet nor any other party is, uh, can be um, in, um, intervened in these issues. The political issues are completely independent from that. This is my understanding of secularism. The last question, uh, actually two last questions, oh, <laughs> rather three. Uh, my name is Ahmed Sesi. I am a member of the UMA project, and I have a question concerning the linguistic autonomy of uh, Tunisia against the background of the Independence Day or the anniversary of the Independence Day. I wanted to ask whether you plan in um, uh, whether Tunisia is planning to um, be linguistically independent in the future, so that Arabic doesn't only it does, is not only an official language but it's also the language of education uh, we're just going to listen to two further questions before we listen to the answers uh, my name is Ayman Maziek. I am uh, the chairman of the Council of Muslims in Germany. Mr. Uh, President it's a great honor to welcome you here in Germany welcome to Berlin, I have a question concerning the fact that we often struggle here in Germany and in the Western world. Um, the uh, development in the Arab world is seen from the um, Western lands. 
rather most of them lands. Uh, people have not taken to the streets for Islam. They were combating for, uh, for freedom, for economic prosperity. And here uh, in Germany, people often uh, try to uh, focus on the Islam, uh, the Muslim aspect, the Islamist aspect. Of course, these the, the majority of these uh, peoples are uh, Muslim. I think uh, this uh, the, the question of the moderator also had this undertone. Of course, it's it's just obvious that Muslims constitute the majority of the Tunisian people. This is self-evident, but it was not self-evident for them to live in uh, democracy and in freedom. What's your response to those voices, or how do you um, describe uh, the fact that we need to um, uh, tell people that we cannot look at developments only from the Muslim perspective. Uh, thank you very much. My, nam my name is Marina Schuster. I'm a member of the German Parliament, and I have a question that has been addressed in the um, Committee of Human Rights in the German Parliament. Uh, what uh, is the situation with the, right, the women, women rights, so that they're not the uh, women are not the uh, part of the society who um, lose the revolution. As for the Arabic language, it is an official language in uh, Tunisia. Uh, it is the, uh, the language used in education, but in higher education we do use French. What I think is that uh, Tunis is um, developing its uh, official language. It is of interest to Tunisia to uh, hold, the, uh, French, hold to the French language. It is uh, very beneficial to the, the Tunisian-French relationships, but we do also need to enhance the use of English. Uh, of English. Uh, geographically, we do belong to the Arab world, we do belong to Africa, and we do need a number uh, of languages. So I am against linguistic chauvinism. We do need a multitude of two languages, three languages. I don't think this is detrimental in any way, and I don't think it has anything to do with independence, uh, our independence, um, or the feeling of being independent. I I think is uh, to uh, influence people as much as you get influenced by people, that you have a certain weight in relationships. Uh, but if we imagine that uh, independence means acting as if you were um, the only actor in the cultural sphere, I think the um, major countries can't even talk about independence uh, under this um, definition. We are talking about interdependency, meaning that uh, there are mutual relationships um, that are of, for, of benefit to both parties. We have to uh, influence as much as we get influenced. We need to be independent, but we, do, we can't be followers. Um, as for the Islamophobia question, you addressed the question of Islamophobia. It's, of course, a very important issue. Other Unfortunately, in the Western world, there are some forces which act as if uh, they always need an enemy or a foe. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, you need to, uh, they felt the need to create a new enemy. So they thought of uh, Islam. Uh, so this uh, Islamophobia issue was just fab fabric fabricated. Um, remember that uh, Islamophobia uh, emerged parallel to the theory of a clash of civilizations. So we need to look at Islamophobia in its context. So now the question is, we as peoples, how can you combat Islamophobia? And also, how do we combat the phobia of the, for, for, of the West? Because we do have this phenomenon in the Arab countries. It's actually widespread. Um, jihadist movements are sometimes anti-Semitic or uh, against the Western culture. So it's an element that is present in most societies. This here comes the role of human rights activists um, to uh, combat the, these racist views which um, have a very negative effect on our lives. As for the position of women in Tunisia, I would like to reassure you that uh, women were not liberated by Bourguiba in 1956. 
in the um, uh, law or uh, in personal uh, law. The Tunisian society was already liberated. Bourjiba, if he had uh, been active in other uh, Arab countries, um, he wouldn't have been able to achieve what he has achieved in Tunisia. He wouldn't have been able to eliminate um, um, polygamy. But uh, if polygamy is uh, only 1% uh, in 1% of the cases, that means that it's okay, it's acceptable. If the law states or stipulates that uh, there is a need to educate women and women started to go to school since the beginning of the Second World War, um, if we look at the numbers of educated women, uh, we, we see a clear increase with the, within 10 years, and that was before the issue issuing of the personal law, that um, substantiates the fact that uh, the um, changes, the social changes, uh, have its root in the Tunisian people. In the 90s, 60% of uh, students in the Faculty of Medicine were women, and today, Education is open to women. Uh, I have two daughters and two granddaughters, uh, so you cannot uh, say I do not contribute to um, uh, women's rights. There is no threat to women. This is just a fact. But that doesn't mean that there are some sheikhs, uh, sh uh, there are folklorists who do pose a very um, animated uh, threat. What do we do if some sheikhs um, call for a circumcision, for female circumcision? What can we do? This does happen. The phenomenon does exist, but it's very limited. The large majority of the people uh, do not follow this um, mentality. Let me tell you something. Uh, we had three phases in the issue of women's rights. The first uh, phase is regarding women uh, as um, uh, 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 as um, affected by or dominated by uh, the man. Uh, the second uh, phase was uh, women as a citizen. So women did not care anymore about issues concerning marriage or polygamy or whatever. They were concerned with their political rights and their freedom. Now, political freedoms are granted to women and men alike. Now, the main problem we are facing is um, women and poverty, because statistics show that um, women are, are the more productive gender. Uh, women are those who collect the olives from the olive trees. Women, um, and in spite of that, women are more subject to poverty. So liberali the, the, the liberalization of women means liberalization of Poverty. So the struggle is to eliminate poverty. So if we are able to liberate our people from poverty within five years, that would mean that women in Tunisia would um, enjoy a good position. Uh, when the government, the new government was presented to me, the, the new cabinet was presented to me, I thought something was missing. Uh, we have only three female uh, ministers. But at least we achieved equality in parliament by law. We achieved equality between uh, men and women by law in parliament. And I am ready to um, stipulate by law an equality in the cabinet. Cabinet. So it's not acceptable in Tunisia with this, um, with, with the human resources that we have at our disposal. It's not acceptable to only have three female ministers. I think this is something that uh, the revolution failed in doing. And I hope next time I can um, tell you that we've achieved uh, progress in this uh, field. So again, uh, women's rights are not a problem. Poverty is a problem today. This is uh, the main focus for me. As a physician, I worked in rural areas, I worked in poor suburbs, I worked with disabled children. For me, the um, greatest social threat is poverty. And this is uh, the main reason for self-immolation. So uh, the main threat to women 
is poverty, the inability to uh, to um, reach their their dreams. So this is a part of women's rights, and as a consequence, it's part of human rights. Mr. President, thank you very much for this positive discussion. Uh, we will remain seated, and Mr. Weimayer will give the uh, last remarks. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Paulson, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this, for your free speech, your, uh, the very authentic impression um, uh, of your perspective. And thank you for the interesting contributions to the discussion. We talked about the crucial changes taking place in Tunisia, the country of origin of the Arab Revolution. We talked about the chances emerging out of this revolution, but especially about the challenges uh, facing the country. Mr. President, you have said once that Tunisia is a laboratory, a laboratory uh, in which the experiment democracy is being um, worked on. Um, I hope that this experiment will be a success story. Um, our best wishes to you and the Tunisian people accompany you. We hope that the new elections that will be organized in um, the autumn will result in stable political conditions. As you said this evening, the uh, changes um, of the political process in harmony, we hope that your country will overcome the, this poverty you were addressing. We invite you now, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, talk in depth about uh, all the contents of this evening um, through a small reception in, here in Hotel de Rome. Thank you.